Welcome to a video from Chapter 1, Section 9, Subsection 8. There is actually no Section 9 in Chapter 1. This is the uh, section devoted to daylighting, which was not included in the original textbook, but is a major part of this course. Um, subsection 8 is dealing with configuring a south-facing sawtooth roof on a library that's to be built in Western North Carolina. So, <clears throat> because the climate is cold, or much cooler than most of the rest of North Carolina, and the internal occupancy will be fairly low, it is desired that the daylighting system provides some heat during the winter months which leads to this decision to illuminate the building using south-facing glass and a sawtooth roof, the point being that the south-facing glass will provide some heat during wintertime. As a general rule, library stacks are designed to accommodate columns on a 30 foot by 30 foot on-center column grid. This has become the industry standard in the fabrication of these library stacks. Uh, the columns can be spaced 30 feet apart or 60 feet apart, but not 40 feet or 50 feet. Uh, unless there's some very strong motive to do otherwise, we'll go with the 30 foot by 30 foot module. Uh, in the case of a library where you want to put parking down below, you might want to do a 30 by 60 or a 60 by 60 module. But for the purposes of this particular problem, we're going to assume the minimal grid with an on-center column spacing of 30 by 30. The vertical clearance between the floor surface and the lowest part of the roof structure will be set initially at 10 feet. We don't want to go much less than that for psychological reasons, but it should probably not be much more than that for economic reasons. Economic reasons meaning more building envelope we have to pay for, uh, more heating and cooling losses through the building envelope, and more wind load uh, that increases the structural cost of the building. In tackling this problem, we will first explore design solutions that stick to the exact clearance of 10 feet. Uh, then we might ask questions like, if 10 feet doesn't give us uniform lighting or uniform enough, uh, do we want to raise the roof uh, as a way of solving the non-uniformity in the daylight. For visual effectiveness, the client wants uniform illumination across the space. In other words, people should be able to sit anywhere and read a book and not feel that they are deprived of life. For economy, the client wants the minimal number of roof apertures that will provide satisfactory uniformity of the illumination across the space. That is, the apertures should be spaced as far as possible, apart as possible, consistent with the requirement that the primary zones of illumination for adjacent apertures must touch each other or overlap each other. There cannot be any gaps between the primary zones of illumination. The sawtooth should be of an appropriate size that there is an integer number of sawtooths per bay. In other words, one 30-foot saw sawtooth per 30-foot bay, or two 15-foot sawtooths per 30-foot bay. We could imagine a building with two bays that are 60 feet, and within that we could put three 20-foot bays. The problem with starting with a module like that is that if we decided to expand the library by one bay, um, we would have an odd situation where we could not cover that one bay appropriately with 20-foot apertures or 20-foot sawtooths. So we're going to stick to the rule. It's either a 30-foot sawtooth or a 15-foot wide sawtooth. We're going to assume that the height of the work plane is 2.5 feet above the floor. This is our standard uh, work plane for reading tasks and therefore it's appropriate in a library. The on-center spacing of the vertical mullions in the sawtooth glazing is 7.5 feet. The cross-sectional dimensions of a vertical mullion are 6 inches by 6 inches. 
This is probably a bit large, but we're being a little conservative in our initial estimates. The horizontal mullions at the top and bottom of the glazing are 2.5 inches deep. The vertical mullions in the daylight glazing obscure about 10% of the aperture. If we do the calculations and we say the actual width of the mullions is only 0.5 feet, and we take the ratio of 0.5 to the spacing of these mullions, which is 7.5 feet, we see that in actual physical dimension, when we look perpendicular to the glazing plane, the mullions, the vertical mullions, only obscure 6.7%. However, the effect of the mullions on off-axis light is greater than for light moving perpendicular to the glazing, so the obscuring effect is larger than 6.7% on average. The on-center spacing of the truss joist rafters is 7.5 feet, and in fact we're going to assume that the mullions in the glazing are structural, and they do support the ends of the truss joist rafters. So in other words, there's no need for any deep beam at the top of the aperture. And in fact, the apertures can go all the way up to the underside of the end bearing assembly of the trusses or possibly even all the way to the decking, although we typically wouldn't do that. The cores of the truss joists are to be drawn two inches deep. The wedges of the truss joists are about 1.5 inches in dimension in the cross section. The end bearing assemblies for the sloping joists are five inches deep. And we'll talk about what that means in just a minute. The end webs of the truss joists should be drawn at a slope such that the centroid of the top cord and the centroid of the end web intersect the vertical line through the center of the end bearing assembly without the end web interfering with the bearing surface. So let's talk about what those things mean. I'm going to jump down here for a second. This is a view of what trusses of this sort look like. At the end of every one of these trusses is something called an end bearing assembly, which is a very descriptive term. The end of the truss bears on something and the assembly that facilitates that is called the end bearing assembly. This is a close up view of what one of those look like. So, here we have the top cord members. This is the last web member, which you'll notice has to be at a slope so it doesn't interfere with this. This is the end bearing assembly, which consists in this case of two angles, which are typically at least four inches in this direction. In our case, we're going to assume that's five inches. They are sliding up between, in this case, the two top cord members of the truss. The top cord and the bottom cord of the truss are double angles, and in this case these web members are double angles, and the end bearing assembly consists of two angles also. So that's one version. Here's another version where the web comes up between the two angles that constitute the top cord, and these two angles that constitute the end bearing assembly are now welded on the outside faces of the double angles that constitute the top cord. Now this overlapping of the angles that create the end bearing assembly and the angles that are creating the top cord allows us to actually rotate the angles that are the end bearing assembly and that can result in a situation like this. So you'll notice going off in this direction is the top cord and these end bearing angles, the, that one and that one, have been rotated so that their surfaces are not parallel to the top cord. And likewise, the end bearing assemblies at the other end have been rotated and this rotation has been done so that those end bearing assemblies can rest on a horizontal bearing surface and therefore the, the trusses will sit stably on top of whatever that support surface is until these end bearing assemblies can be welded into place. So this is the classic end bearing assembly that we use for a sloped or what we might call a rafter 
truss. And uh, you'll notice in order to accommodate this rotation, we've gone to a shallower end bearing assembly. This was only two and a half inches, as was this. In this case, it's an average five inch deep. So when I go to the center of this end bearing assembly and measure from the center point to the top of the top cord, it's five inches. And so that's what we're going to assume the end bearing assembly is in our particular uh, design problem. All right, so we've gotten down to this point and let me make sure I'm where I was before. All right, so um, we have covered every one of these items, I think. Let me just make sure. Okay, no, we'll go on to this slide. So, um, initially we're going to assume that there is one sawtooth per 30 foot bay. And I don't know any way to do this except make an assumption, draw it up, and see if it works. And so our challenge is going to be, is this too wide a spacing for the apertures and will the daylight be too uh, non-uniform? In other words, will the primary zones, as we've learned to sort of estimate where they are by drawing these triangles, will those primary zones not touch each other or overlap each other? So we have to figure that out and we have to do it by drawing it to scale. So we're going to design and draw in detail the section through the building showing the entirety of the two most southerly bays. And these, this drawing should include, first of all, in the south wall, an opaque insulated knee wall up to two and a half inches above the floor. And we're just going to draw that for the moment with a six inch thickness. We're going to draw some view glazing from two and a half feet above the floor to seven feet above the floor, which gives a pretty good view with uh, ample view, but not a lot of solar exposure. And then we're going to draw an overhang projecting three feet out from the view glazing. Now, in this case, I've just said three feet. The typical thing we do in North Carolina, where the latitude is roughly 36 degrees, at least in the sort of northern part of the state where Raleigh is located and a lot of western North Carolina is located, uh, we say we want the overhang over view glazing. Remember, view glazing is not primarily for daylighting, it's primarily for view, and we want to pr protect it from excess solar gain. The overhang on view glazing is typically designed to block all of the beam sunlight during the hot part of the year, which would mean roughly from equinox to equinox, or in other words, about March 21st to September 21st. So if we put out an overhang that creates a shading profile angle of about 36 degrees, in other words, an angle about equal to latitude, that will block the beam sunlight from all of that view glazing for the six hotter months of the year, or at least the six months when the sun is higher in the sky. Now, in this construct, I might just do 36 degrees. In this case, I just said project it out three feet because I know the view glazing is four feet high and a three foot four, uh, three, four, five right triangle will have an angle of about 36 degrees. So I can either draw it at three feet or probably a better strategy is to always just construct the 36 degree profile angle and figure out how far out the overhang has to go in order to block that. So we should also include a beam of appropriate depth supporting the vertical portion of each sawtooth. And for simplicity, we will assume that depth to be L over 20. So since we're spanning 30 feet, we're on a 30 by 30 grid. Uh, the length of the beam that's supporting this vertical portion of the sawtooth will be 30 feet over 20, or in other words, one and a half feet or 18 inches. The drawing should also include a curb beneath the sawtooth glazing. That curb should be about 8% of the 30 foot 
horizontal width of the sawtooth. So in other words, the wider the sawtooth, the more the water coming down, the higher the curb should be, and 8% is a pretty good starting point. It depends on a lot of factors, and 8% in certain cir circumstances may not be exactly right, but it's a starting point that will get us familiar with the idea that there has to be a curb underneath the glass in the sawtooth and that curb is there to channel water that comes rushing down the sloped surface of the sawtooth. So if the curb is 8%, we multiply 0 0.08 times the 30 foot uh, horizontal width of the sloped portion of the roof. And then we convert that from inches, from feet to inches, and we get 28.8 inches of depth for that curb. This is a substantial amount, um, but that's what's necessary when you bring all that water down into this uh, V-shaped channel underneath the glazing. We're going to round that up to 29 inches for simplicity because the number was pretty approximate anyway. And um, then we're also going to do the following. As we slope the roof, the the slice through the insulation changes its angle and therefore the vertical dimension changes its angle. So we're going to just add to this 29 inches, we're going to add 13 inches, which is to accommodate the thickness of the roof assembly. And that thickness comes from adding the insulation and the thickness of the decking and the thickness of the end bearing assembly and then making some estimate of how much those are going to increase uh, as caused by the rotation of the surface up into its final sloped configuration. The sawtooth glazing will be of an appropriate height to represent 20% of the floor area, properly accounting for the obscuring effect of the mullions. And then we're going to have two and a half inch deep mullions at the top and bottom of the glazing. So the drawing should also include uh, truss joists of appropriate depth to span the 30 feet. We could take um, 30 feet over 24, which is as shallow as we get for trusses, or we can just say, ah, let's call it L over 20. And for the moment, we're just going to do that. We need five inch deep end bearing assemblies, as mentioned earlier for these truss joists, and that's to allow the rotation of the truss joists so that the joist top cord can go uphill, uh, but the end bearing assemblies will have their bottom surfaces horizontal so that they can rest in a stable way on some sort of horizontal bearing surface. And that five inches is measured from the center of the end bearing assembly. So, that's a key piece of information that you need to keep in mind in order to do this drawing properly. There'll be corrugated steel decking of an appropriate depth to span the seven and a half feet between the truss joists, which turns out to be one and a half inch deep decking. We've said that can go up to eight feet. We probably don't want to jump to three inch depth. We probably don't even want to jump to two inch depth. We're going to stick with this inch and a half deep. 7 inch deep uh, rigid insulation on the top of the corrugated decking and I think I'll correct a little spelling while I'm here. Oh man, that's not even right. I'm losing my mind. Okay. Wow. Whoops. Okay, an overhang above the soft tooth glazing. That overhang extending far enough, enough out to assure protection of the entire sawtooth glazing out to a profile angle of 20 degrees. And my degree symbol is not quite right there. 20 degrees off of vertical. So the line extending from the lower end of the protective overhang down to the bottom edge of the glazing will be sloped at 20 degrees off of vertical. And the drawing finally should include two slope lines marking the primary zone of illumination for each of the sawtooth glazings. 
The line representing the deepest penetration of the primary zone has a slope of one on the vertical to one and a half on the horizontal. The line representing the shallow end of the primary zone of illumination should be constructed by connecting the lower edge of the overhang or the outer edge of the overhang to the inner edge of the bottom horizontal mullion. That is representing the acceptance angle for the steepest ray of light that can barely penetrate the glazing. Okay, so after we've done this drawing, we're going to check to see if the primary zones of illumination actually touch or overlap. If the arrangement with a single sawtooth per bay does not meet our criterion for uniform illumination on the work plane, we will do the following. We'll do a drawing in which the clearance height between the floor surface and the bottom of the structure has been increased to the point at which the single sawtooth per 30 foot bay will just meet our criterion for uniform illumination on the work plane. In that drawing, we will clearly indicate what clearance height that would be, and we'll compare that to the original assumption of 10 feet to see how much we had to increase the overall height of the structure to achieve uniform lighting. Then we're going to do something else. We're going to do a detailed section drawing at the original clearance height of 10 feet with two sawtooths per bay, bay each sawtooth being 15 feet wide. In this drawing, we'll make note of any transfer beams that would be required to saw, support sawtooth beams that do not occur at a columns. In the previous discussion, we were talking about one sawtooth per bay, one beam per each vertical part of the sawtooth. Those beams would all arrive at columns, which are spaced 30 feet apart. As soon as we have 15 foot sawtooths, we have supporting beams every 15 feet, and half of those beams don't arrive at a column, so they have to be supported in some way by transfer beams at their ends. After doing all that, we're going to draw up a variation of two above, which replaces the 15 foot wide sawtooth at the south wall with a 15 foot wide strip of flat roof. Flattish, meaning it has a slope of one quarter inch per foot to assure that water gets off of it, uh, but generally kind of flat. Uh, and we'll check to see if that option meets our criterion for uniform illumination. Um, and we'll see if we need a clear story in the south wall, and then we'll see if even that works. The key reason for replacing the sawtooth at the south wall is some people feel like that tall wall looming over people's heads is not a very friendly human scale kind of interface. So we kind of like to see if we can pull the structure down at the south wall. Okay, so we're going to go to AutoCAD and we're going to talk our way through this. And the first thing I want to do is spend a little time focusing on the notion of what an end bearing assembly is. So here we have a girder beam, and here we have a, a double angle truss, and the top cord of this truss is arriving uh, at its end bearing assembly. And you'll notice that I've shown the, the depth of that end bearing assembly as being five inches from the bearing surface right here, up to the top of that top cord. Um, and by the way, we said the top cord was going to be drawn at two inches deep, and we're just going to draw kind of a center line there at the center, which is one inch down. So in other words, if the dimension from right there down to the bottom of the end bearing assembly, in other words, from the top of the top cord to the bottom of the end bearing assembly is five inches, then from the bottom of the end bearing assembly to the center of the top cord will be four inches. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to assume that the dimension of the end bearing assembly in this direction is five feet. 
and we've drawn in this case a beam with a 12 inch wide flange in order to comfortably accommodate two five inch long end bearing assemblies. So that's the customary way in which an end bearing assembly is used. Slightly less customary is this situation where the end bearing assembly has been rotated relative to the top cord in order to allow the top cord to slope upward in this rafter mode. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the five inch dimension is maintained along the center, the vertical center line of this end bearing assembly. So as we rotate this thing, we rotate it about that point right there so that that dimension does not change. So this part of the top cord comes down, this part of the top cord goes up, but that point on the top cord does not move as we make this rotation. So I'm emphasizing all that so that your drawing will be really clear and you won't get confused about uh, what the rules are when we go about making these sloped rafters. So I'm going to zoom out here for a second, then I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to show the drawing that's been done so far. Okay, so this is the south zone. This is the next to the south zone. And you'll notice that I've shown the center line of this column as 30 feet from the center line of that column. And by the way, this short dash, long dash is the drawing convention that we use for the center lines of columns or the center lines of pretty much anything in our building structure. So here I have a center line for a column, a center line for a column, and a center line for a column. Now we have no guidelines at this point for the magnitude of columns and one of the reasons is that um, it's hard to come up with guidelines. For example, um, the column on the top floor of a building might only be like a three or four inch diameter steel pipe. On the other hand, the column at the base of a 50 story tall building could be really huge. It might be four feet by four feet. So, uh, depending on the material and the grade of the material and so forth. So in this case, what I did was I drew 12 inch wide by 18 inch deep um, wide flange beams. And by the way, just to illustrate that point, I'm going to come along here. And for some reason, I didn't do that right. And so I've drawn this beam 18 inches deep. And I've drawn it 12 inches wide. And by the way, that 12 inches, as I said, was to handle the end bearing assemblies. Except in this case, this end bearing assembly is there as expected. But now we have a special condition on this side of this beam, which is the following. We're going to have a vertical member coming up, supporting this end bearing assembly at the top. So here's, here is the bottom mullion the top mullion and then above that is the end bearing assembly for this top end of this truss rafter. Now that structural element it has to occur every seven and a half feet to support these trusses which occur every seven and a half inches. So we drew this beam and um, for purposes of what we're doing, I just drew the column as 12 inches wide also. This column though, unless it's concrete or something like that, if it's a steel column, it's going to be a lot smaller than that. But we're not focusing on that issue right now, so don't be distracted by me drawing that at 12 inches. That's, that's like a marker that I'm just putting there because I don't know the answer yet. And that's not really part of this assignment. Okay, so here's what we do. 
we take the floor surface, which is right there, the top piece surface of this. I draw a line there and I offset it two and a half feet to get the work plane. Then I offset that line again 10 feet, or in other words, 120 inches, to establish where the bottom surface of this uh, spanning beam is occurring. Then I have to offset that point another 18 inches. And by the way, when you draw this, you know, I've gone to the, all, all the trouble of drawing a wide flange section here just to help reinforce the idea that there's a beam there. For your purposes, though, you could just draw that beam as a 12 inch wide by 18 inch deep rectangle and label it beam, and that will be good enough for this assignment. So I've gotten up to this point, which is now uh, actually 11 and a half inches above the floor surface, and that establishes the top surface of the spanning beam, which is the bearing surface for the end bearing assembly of those truss rafters, and also for the vertical column or structural mullion that's going to occur every seven and a half feet in this vertical portion of the sawtooth. So all that's been pretty simple and straightforward and now what I did was I went in and I drew my end bearing assembly and I marked off the five inch vertical dimension and by the way I don't think I drew this precisely so um, let me see what I did wrong there. Okay, then I'm still slightly wrong. So, let's hope you do better than that. Alright, so that's 5.1 inches. From that point right there to that bottom surface of the end bearing assembly. And I apologize that that was not more precisely done. But, um, that was actually within tolerances for any kind of construction problem, but you need to try to not make mistakes like that because if you get casual about them, they start to accumulate. Okay, so then we did a calculation earlier where we said we needed such and such a depth of curb and, um, and I think this number is a little bit high. Uh, we said 8% of 30 feet. So let me go pull this up and I'm going to say 0.08 and I'm going to put 30 feet, and then I'm going to say 12 inches per foot, and I'm going to multiply all those things together. I'm going to say it's that times that times that, and I get 28.8. So let's go back to the drawing here and see. We set that curb height. Let me just pull this up. If my file is riddled with errors, this will be good because you'll see how you can make mistakes. That's part of what I'm going to teach you. Okay, so for some reason I put that at 29.6, which I'm going to leave there because as long as I'm a little bit above the 28.8, I'm going to feel okay. Oh, I know how that got to be that way. Somehow in the original statement of this, I said, let's make that 29 and we'll estimate this to be 13 from that point right there, the lowest point on the trough to the, end, to the top of the support beam. I said, make that 13. So we added all those together and we got 42. So let's see if I got... Um, 42 for that dimension. Yes, I did. So I, may, I rounded a bunch of stuff up, and in the end, uh, this was the result, is that instead of 28.8, I got 29.6. Okay, then I put in my two and a half inch high uh, bottom mullion. And then I have to figure out what's the height of the glass. 
Now this is where life gets a little interesting. So we're going to pull up um, our spreadsheet again. And we're going to say that the area of floor There's one sawtooth per bay, mm -hmm. so the area being illuminated is going to equal 30 star 30, which is 900 square feet. And then the area of the is going to be equal to 0.2 times that which is 180 square feet. Now, the horizontal dimension and I'm going to say effective because remember what we said was there's some kind of obscuring effect from the mullions and we said we're going to estimate it to be 10% even though the mullions are actually only 6.7% of that horizontal dimension. So in other words, we're saying when we account for the 10% obscuring effect, the effective horizontal dimension of the glass is going to equal 180 times 0.9, which is 90%. Or in other words, uh, and I didn't mean to do that, it's actually 30 feet, which is the overall length of the bay, uh, star 9, so it's 27 feet of effective horizontal dimension. And then I'm going to say the vertical dimension has to be equal to, so I'm going to say equals 180 divided by 27 or in other words, 6.67, and then I'm going to convert this. So I'll say the vertical dimension in inches, so this would be in feet. If I want it in inches, I'll say it's equal to this, star 12, which is 80 inches. And by the way, 0.6666 feet is exactly 8 inches, and 6 feet is 72. So 6.66666 feet is 72 inches plus 8 inches, or 80 inches. And things like that you'll learn to do in your head pretty quickly. But it never hurts to write it down, because anything you did in your head you can make mistakes on. And it's always good to have a record you can go check. All right, so we said the 80 inches is the vertical dimension of the glass. So I set that from right there up to there. Then I draw the uh, top mullions, which are two and a half inches in the vertical direction. And then I draw the end bearing assembly. And I come up here and I establish the appropriate point. And so I'm, uh, I didn't want to do that. I'm going to come from right there, down there, and I get 5 inches. So remember, we're rotating the top cord about the center vertical position of this end bearing assembly. And now we know the top cord has to go through that point, and it has to go through the comparable point down at the bottom end. So we have an end bearing assembly down here, and we've marked the appropriate top point about which we're rotating. We have an end bearing assembly up here and we've marked the appropriate point about which we're rotating and we have established the the slope of that top cord top surface the top surface of the top cord now this decking is going to come out and it's going to establish an outer edge here um, which defines um, the shading element for this sawtooth glazing. Now, one of the things we want to do is I'll go down to this end to look at it because this is where I actually did the construct. So here I have, I have this um, 
top cord which extended I just extended it out or actually I didn't what I did was I drew this line I drew it through the bottom of the of the glazing that edge right there I drew it vertically and then I rotated it over 20 degrees now remember in daylight systems like this we've said the profile angle for shading of the entire glazing should be between 16 and 24 degrees. I just arbitrarily picked something in the middle of this. So I created this line, I rotated it over by 20 degrees. Then in AutoCAD, I used my extend function to extend the top cord or the top surface of the top cord, and that established the outer reaches of the corrugated decking which rests on the top of the top cord. So that defines how far out this overhang goes. And by the way, typically on this edge, we'll put an angle, which helps reinforce the decking and, and reinforce and contain the insulation. Now, that angle is technically not necessary because the decking can span from one truss to the next. Um, but people sometimes do screwy things like they put ladders on that edge or a bunch of people might hang on that edge or something. So localized loads are taken care of at the edge by uh, that edge angle, which can be as deep, theoretically, as the insulation plus the thickness of the decking. So that establishes how far out that goes, and then once that's established, it can be replicated back here and so forth all the way through the structure. So this is a pretty clean structure right now. We got an 80 put 80 inch vertical dimension to the to the glazing in the sawtooth. Now we're going to draw, draw these lines that represent the primary zones of illumination. So the primary zone from the south uh, the primary zone of illumination associated with the south bay will start at the lower edge of this overhang because that's where sort of light is blocked all the way out to that point so that kind of defines our aperture from a lighting point of view and we we uh, create a line passing through that point with a slope of 1 to 1 1.5 and in this case I drew it as 10 inches and 15 inches because I'm drawing in units of inches right now in this program. So this defines sort of the inner um, extent of the primary zone of illumination or the deepest penetration of light from the south sawtooth. This line, on the other hand, I drew. Let me undo this. I snapped it to the outer edge and I snapped it to the inner edge of this mullion and then I extended it down to the work plane. So these two lines define the primary zone of illumination for the south aperture. These two uh, do so for the south aperture, the south sawtooth that's in the second bay. And one of the things you'll notice is they don't intersect here. So your first assignment was to figure out, um, well, let me go one step further here. And, well, okay, so let's do that. So the first thing you were asked to do was, if these zones don't touch or overlap, how high do we have to move this structure. So the way we do it in AutoCAD is we'd extend this line and that line. So we'd use the fillet function. We'd make those two lines intersect like right here. And then in this drawing what I did was I took the whole roof structure and actually what I did was I lowered the floor. Um, but philosophically it's like raising the roof. I keep going back to the wrong program here. So let me uh, zoom in here for a second. Since my rulers don't seem to be working. Okay, 
So I extended this line to that line so they intersected and then I raised the roof to the point that that line, that intersection occurs on the work plane. So this now satisfies our criterion of uniform illumination on the work plane. And we've gone to 194.3 inches. We were originally at 120, so we've had to raise it 64 uh, inches roughly, which is a little over five feet. Now, if it's a if it's a huge building, we might not object to doing that because it's mainly a volume driven building and the external surface of wall is not that big a deal. On the other hand, if it's a fairly small building, we could increase the cost of it quite a bit by increasing the height of the perimeter wall. So we don't know at this point whether this is a prudent thing to do or not. So we're just going to do this solution and let it stand there. Now here's something else we were supposed to go look at. We were supposed to look at the south wall. So I'm going to zoom into this wall for a second. And uh, in this case, we were told that there should be a knee wall up to two and a half inches. And typically that means the top surface of that mullion is two and a half feet up, excuse me, 30 inches up. And we don't want to go any higher than that because we don't that want that knee wall shading our desktops where people are doing our tabletops where people might be reading a book. So we go from that 30 inch point up to seven feet and that defines our view glazing. And in the statement of the problem, we said this overhang right here should either be three feet because this vertical opening is four feet. A three foot opening creates roughly a 36 degree angle there. there. Or in this case, I just drew a, a line from the center point of the mullion. In other words, at the base of the glazing, I drew a vertical line I tilted it over 36 degrees and that defines the profile angle that I would like for my overhang to go out to. So we can either just make that three feet, which is close enough, or we can measure off 36 inches. The nice thing about 36 degrees rather is that it always applies no matter how tall this view glazing is. Uh, so in a way, the 36 degrees is a better guide. And again, that 36 degrees is it's essentially equal to the latitude of the building uh, in western North Carolina. Now, um, that establishes this set of lines and this they are sloped at 1.5 out of 5. So in a way, what I could do is I could just get rid of these to avoid any unnecessary confusion. And I have this, which represents the deepest penetration of useful daylight from the view glazing. So remember, the view glazing is primarily for view, but it does provide, really close to the window, some important daylighting for somebody who happens to be working right next to the window. Now, that leaves a gap between the daylight primary zone of illumination from the view glazing and this demarker which shows uh, one of the boundaries of the primary zone from the uh, sawtooth glazing above. There's a gap there of 68 inches. The nice thing about this drawing is I don't have to calculate any of that. I just do a dimension on it and the computer or the AutoCAD tells me what that number is. So that's a dark zone that I would like to fix with some view glazing. So I took 68.08 and I said, what's 20% of that? And I got about a 16 inch vertical dimension. Um, and I can't remember how I did that. So let's run through it for a second. We had uh, 68, I don't know what it was, 0.5 inches roughly. 
and then we're going to say its horizontal dimension uh, is 27 feet and um, well an, an easier way to do that is the following I'm just going to put 0.2 here and then I'm going to say 68.5 times 0.2 is that and then I'm going to divide that by 0.9 to account for the mullion effect and I get about 15.2 inches and then I just rounded that up to 16 because I was being overly generous so I made the vertical dimension of that glazing 16 and then the miraculous thing was I said okay let's put this sloped line from that edge so it just intersects that and that then allowed me to just put this whole glazing assembly uh, just slightly above this overhang so it clears and does its job even though it's fairly low in the wall so we have the primary zone from this clear story glazing which is defined by that there is a primary zone from the view glazing that does that and then a primary zone from the sawtooth above so i'm going to zoom out a little bit and basically i took all this stuff that i developed having to do with this overhang and this clear story glazing and I just translated it up here and now it's a bit oversized so if I was being super rigorous I'd say well I put too much glazing I didn't need to go the full 68 I just needed to go somewhat less so I could lower the amount of glazing here but for the moment we've kind of illustrated the point and we're going to uh, say that we've taken care of this. So this, these first two drawings represent the 10-foot clearance and a clearance necessary to make the primary zones just touch each other. And you'll remember we had to raise the roof 64 inches to make that work. The third assignment was to look at the double sawtooth. So two sawtooths um, per bay. Now that means we need a support beam right here and that beam can't just float in air because it has responsibility for supporting all this is annoying for supporting that much roof halfway to the south wall and halfway to the first interior column. So all that roof is getting supported on this beam and that beam then has to be supported by the transfer beam. So adding the transfer beam, which runs continuously, this doesn't show very well in this drawing because of the way the drawing is constructed, but that transfer beam runs from this column to that column. So that's an additional complexity, but we have reduced the size of the glass. Above we had a seven and a half foot by 80 inch glass. Um, now we're down to seven and a half feet by 40 inch glass, which is a little more manageable. Um, but we also are getting more uniform light. So now you'll notice even with the 10 foot clearance, which was kind of our original target, we're getting a really good overlap of these zones. So that double sawtooth works fine. And in fact, one thing that we need to check is this whole issue of I've got this sloped line. I need my overhang. I haven't even constructed the overhang. So this drawing is really incomplete as of the moment. I need to put the overhang in. 
and see whether I even need a clear story and I haven't done that yet so but you will do that and then here um, we've constructed this flat roof zone so the slope is one quarter of an inch per foot towards the perimeter of the building um, I've asked the question if we put a clear story here um, will we get enough light penetration and you can see even with this little dinky overhang that I drew which is not enough we still have this dark zone so basically we conclude that even though we wanted to get rid of this south sawtooth this whole flat roof scheme is not working and it's leaving us with this really dark zone Now, in doing problems like this for the class, let me just make a few comments. Um, I have shown these trusses in fair detail. I've shown um, things like corrugated decking. Uh, for your purposes, you can just draw that as an inch and a half deep layer and label that corrugated decking, just like I've drawn a layer for insulation. And, designated it as insulation. As far as the truss is concerned, you need to show that line, which is the bottom edge of the top cord. You need to show the top edge of the top cord. You need to show the proper depth for the end bearing assembly, and then just outline the overall shape of the truss. So you don't have to bother putting in all these web members. It's just key that you understand the importance of the end bearing assembly that you put the depths of the truss appropriately we agreed initially that you would draw it at l over 20 or in other words at 18 inches deep in this case we made it the same depth as the steel beams that are supporting the vertical portions of the sawtooth so you're basically going to outline that truss uh, rather than draw that and you can just hatch in the, the decking and label it accordingly. You'll also notice some other things that I did here that um, some of which are a little funky. Um, I drew this 20 degree angle again for the shading of this clear story. So I took a line from the bottom edge of the glass. I drew it vertically. I tilted it over 20 degrees and then I said I need some kind of an overhang so I could have drawn a little teeny horizontal overhang here instead though I drew this odd feature which is slightly sloped and uh, I did that because an overhang like that provides the required uh, protection but also opens up the glass a little bit more to the sky now this is a whole subtle art in itself what that shape should be this sloped element and there are a lot of people who have very fascinating ideas about what's the optimal way to do that overhang and i don't even suggest that i've done the optimum here but I'm alerting you to the fact that there are interesting questions having to do with that. And if you're interested in this shading idea, you can go do it. Take a look at that. You'll also note here that I've shown a lured overhang over the, uh, over the view glazing. Um, that makes the overhang a little less oppressive since it bounces a little bit of diffuse light through. Um, it also uh, lets wind go through it, so you have less uplift on it. Uh, it's a little more effective at shedding snow. Uh, and finally, it bounces vertical rain. Uh, it helps keep that away from the facade by bouncing it away from the facade. So typically, this is not going to be some kind of opaque element. We don't want to splatter water up on this glazing, for example because that glazing right there will look dirty all the time if it's got a bunch of dirty splattered water up on it. So typically these overhangs will be some sort of louvered system. That also tends to discourage birds from roosting on it, although that's still a problem. So, 
that concludes our discussion of configuring a south-facing sawtooth roofing system for a library in western North Carolina.